Hello. Uh, let's continue forward now and talk about the history of the Florida Constitution uh, from the earliest Constitution, which was drafted in 1838, adopted in 1839, but did not become effective until Florida was admitted as a state uh, in 1845. Uh, Florida then had a constitution as we entered the Confederacy in 1861, a constitution uh, immediately after the, the Civil War in 1865, which never became an effective constitution for Florida because the federal government rejected it, uh, saying that it, uh, it was not an adequate constitution for a state uh, that had been uh, to bring the state back into the Union after the Civil War. The Constitution that accomplished our reentry into the United States as a sovereign state was the Constitution of 1868, and as you'll see, that has some very important provisions in it. We then moved to the post-Reconstruction period and the adoption of the Constitution of 1885, and finally, uh, in 1968, we get around to revising that Constitution in very substantial ways that we'll describe in a separate lecture uh, that we will uh, provide to you uh, following uh, this lecture. Our objectives in this are obviously to provide everyone with a uh, historical uh, point of view to understand what Florida's had as uh, its Constitution. That's going to impact a great deal on cases that you read because you will read some cases uh, that uh, treat constitutional provisions which were once in our Constitution and are no longer there. So it'll give you some guidance. It also can show you the progress that Florida has made in establishing our, the principles under which we operate as a state. Um, I hope that uh, this segment will give you some appreciation for the interesting history of Florida. And I'm going to take digressions a couple of times just because I've stumbled across things that I think may interest you, at least those of you who care about Florida history. So let's get started. Um, we have these six constitutions, which I've already identified. Um, but we should point out that before Florida was a, a part of the United States, Florida had a constitution. And this is not widely known. I think very few lawyers understand the fact uh, that indeed we had a constitution of 1812. Now remember that Florida did not become uh, a territory of the United States until 1819. But we had a constitution. It was a constitution that was um, adopted in the city of Cadiz, Spain, and you'll find, if you go to Cadiz, you'll find a monument to this constitution. It was adopted uh, by uh, Spanish authorities that were then in, in Cadiz. Um, and then uh, if you want to find another example of a monument to uh, uh, the constitution of 1812, you can go to St. Augustine. In St. Augustine, you have a constitutional plaza in the middle of St. Augustine. It was only recently that I understood that the Constitution that was being referred to was the Constitution of 1812. It was a Spanish Constitution. And so uh, in, in 2012, uh, there was a celebration of the 200th anniversary of the Cadiz Constitution the first constitution of governing Florida. And um, um, as we look at that constitution, we find not very many principles that uh, are pertinent to us today, but at least you should know that, uh, that it was a fairly liberal constitution in several respects. One, it was possible for people who had been slaves to uh, get their freedom under the Spanish constitution. And there was a procedure set up that allowed people to, to uh, achieve uh, their freedom even if they've been, uh, been slaves at one point. Uh, it, the Spanish Constitution was regarded as an extremely liberal constitution. And when the Spanish monarchy uh, 
came back to power uh, and was controlled by uh, forces of Napoleon, uh, it uh, repealed and displaced the Constitution of 1812. So it was in place only a short period of time, but it governed Florida uh, for a few critical years. Um, and so now we go to the Constitution of 1838 in Florida. Now I want you to remember that Florida is an extremely small state in terms of population at that time. The picture being shown is a picture of, the, uh, of a replica of the state capital as it was originally established. Uh, once the people who had established the state capital uh, settled on the fact that the state capital would be in Tallahassee, uh, halfway between St. Augustine and Pensacola. And so in a, because there was a need for a state capital, the, uh, this log cabin was built. It was built on the grounds uh, that are now the grounds of the state capital, uh, but was torn down, obviously. The replica, I think you'll find uh, at uh, the uh, Florida Museum located uh, in Tallahassee at the, what was once called the Junior Museum, but location close to Tallahassee where uh, that is still being displayed. Now, uh, the, uh, if you look at the distribution of the population of the United States and look at the distribution of population in Florida in 1830, where we began to have a census applied, uh, look, look at Florida. Uh, look at this map. Uh, there are large portions of, of, of Florida are shown as white. There's no significant population in those areas. And some portions of northern Florida are shown with a population uh, that, uh, that is really quite, quite small. Um, uh, and you look at a state with sparse population, but it decides that it will have a constitution and decides it will seek admission uh, as one of the states of the United States. It's a territory. Uh, it's a territory that's governed uh, by the federal government. The governor of uh, Florida is a territorial governor appointed by, uh, by the president. Initially, it's, it's Andrew Jackson. Uh, later, uh, a significant figure is Richard Keith Call, who becomes a territorial governor. And But there are a series of territorial governors during the time that uh, before Florida became a state. But in 1838, uh, uh, Florida uh, had a uh, constitutional convention. And one of the people who was at that constitutional convention was James D. Westcott, Jr. Um, now, when James Westcott uh, came to Florida, uh, he became associated with Andrew Jackson. He was elected to the U.S. Senate, served for four years, and he served on the Territorial Council and was a member of the original Constitutional Convention in uh, uh, 1838. The Constitutional Convention that was held at St. Joe, uh, St. Joseph, which we now, as, now know as Port St. Joe, and there's still a monument in Port St. Joe, this Constitution. Um, the James Westcott's son, also known as James D. Westcott, Jr., curiously, uh, was the son of this famous person. Uh, he was born in Tallahassee. He attended the uh, seminary west of the Suwannee. We now know that institution as Florida State University. Um, he served as a legislator. He was appointed as attorney general, and he was uh, appointed the Supreme Court by Governor Reed. Governor Reed was a Republican. Uh, James Westcott was a Democrat, but James Westcott was very well regarded and, uh, and was appointed by, by Governor Reed in, our, in part to restore the, uh, the status of the, of the Supreme Court. Uh, he served on the court uh, for a period of time, and of course, we know Westcott 
because uh, we know him today not as a person, but as a uh, he When he died, he left uh, an inheritance, and he left it to the seminary west of the Swanee. It was the first major gift ever received by what is now Florida State University, and we've honored James Westcott by naming the main administration building uh, for Westcott. When you go to that site, uh, you'll see uh, a sculpture on the lawn in front, uh, not of Westcott, uh, but you'll see one of Thomas Jefferson's grandson who came to Florida and became mayor of Tallahassee and became a great advocate for the establishment of this institution of higher learning in Tallahassee. And so Francis Epps' uh, sculpture is located uh, uh, in front of Westcott Building. Uh, uh, Francis Epps uh, went on to be one of the, not only mayor of Tallahassee, the title then was intendant of Tallahassee, but he also went on the first board to govern uh, the seminary west of the Swanee later in 1947, Florida State University. Then if we look now at the 1838 Constitution, which Justice West, Westcott's father served on, we find a, uh, uh, some major points. Uh, again, it was not to be effective until Congress admitted Florida to the Union, and that happened in 1845. In 1845, there were three states admitted to the Union. One was Texas, and Texas came in alone. But Florida came in along with Iowa. And Iowa had a, a somewhat larger population, still quite, quite sparsely populated. But they came in because in those days it was necessary to pair a slave state and a free state, a non-slave state, in order to keep the balance of power in the United States Senate uh, at, uh, uh, at equality between uh, free states and, and slave states. And so Florida, <coughs> paired with, with Iowa, uh, became a state. And the Constitution that came in, uh, Florida, that brought Florida into the Union, was this Constitution of 1838 adopted by a small margin of votes in 1839. Um, it had a number of significant features. There was no property qualification for, for office in Florida. Uh, the governor uh, had one four-year term. The, um, there was a separation of powers provision. There, were, there was a separate article <coughs> on banking. Uh, because again, uh, remember that banking uh, is a very significant national issue during this time. Andrew Jackson was elected president in 18, 1828. Um, uh, in 1838, the issue of banking was really a, a significant issue, and it was it was so uh, significant that we see uh, some restrictions on, on bankers. Um, legislature, House had one one year term, Senate two years. Um, the legislature had the power to uh, to elect not only executive officers, but judges. Uh, the legislature has all the power back in 1838. Initially, there were 41 House members, and 17 Senate districts. Uh, Dade, Monroe, and Hillsborough shared a senator. Uh, there was a county in those days known as Mesquita County. Uh, curiously, that name has disappeared from Florida history. Uh, but St. John's and Mesquita uh, shared uh, a, a senator, and Leon County had two senators. Uh, in 1838, the judicial branch had a Supreme Court, courts of chancery, uh, a circuit court, and justices of the peace. We still had JPs in Florida up until the 1972 revision of the Florida Constitution. 
The, these judges were elected by both houses of the legislature. There were four circuits, uh, western, middle, eastern, and southern. And the circuit judges were initially served as Supreme Court justices. The attorney general was not an officer of the executive branch. He was an officer of the legislative branch. So again, look at all the power being focused in the legislature. Um, the suffrage was every free white male over age 21 residing in Florida for at least two years. Uh, barred from office were bankers uh, and people who had participated in a duel and ministers of the gospel. So along with restrictions on people who had been serious lawbreakers like people who had fought duels we did not let ministers of the gospel or bankers serve in public office. We then have the Civil War, and uh, there's going to be a, a little bit of departure from state constitutional law here just because some of this history is really delicious, and I can't go through this era without some comment about it. Uh, note that, that Lincoln was elected on uh, November the 6th, of, 19, of, of 1860. Uh, then before he's even inaugurated, South Carolina secedes from the Union. In 1861, Florida forces are re repelled at Fort Barrancas. January 10th, Florida secedes after Mississippi. January 15th, the Florida militia demands the surrender of Fort Pickens, and the commanding officer, just a lieutenant uh, in the U.S. Army, uh, refuses. The inaugurations occur in February uh, uh, for Jefferson Davis and in March for Lincoln, and then in April, Fort Sumter is fired on. So when were the first shots of the Civil War? It has nothing to do with state constitutional law, but gosh, you can't pass these fact, these historical facts without some observation. The first shots for the Civil War were fired in Pensacola. Um, there were three forts in Pensacola, uh, and they're extremely important. Uh, you'll notice that Fort Pickens is out uh, on uh, Santa, uh, Santa Rosa Island across the bay from Fort Barrancas, uh, and there are actually third and fourth uh, fort around Pensacola Bay. But the entrance to Pensacola Bay, which is a very important bay, was controlled uh, on the south by Fort Pickens and on the north by Fort Barrancas. Uh, and so what happens uh, on the eve of the Civil War is that, uh, that, uh, that militia uh, loyal to, to Florida uh, come to, uh, to uh, Fort Barrancas, uh, overrun uh, Fort Barrancas, uh, the federal, uh, uh, before they get there, the federal court, federal troops remove uh, the cannon and quite a bit of the ammunition from Fort Barrancas, spike the guns at Fort Barrancas, and move the munitions to Fort Pickens across the bay at, uh, uh, sitting on the very tip of Santa Rosa Island. This is a picture of of, of Fort Pickens. At some point, the federal troops uh, come out to Santa Rosa Island, uh, demand the surrender of, uh, of uh, Fort Pickens, and the commanding officer of, of Fort Pickens uh, refuses. Um, and the first shots of the Civil War uh, occur, um, Excuse me, I've advanced too much. Uh, first shots of the Civil War are fired. Florida thereafter adopts its ordinance of secession and adopts a constitution. And so in November of 1861, Governor uh, Perry uh, calls uh, for a constitutional convention to establish a new constitution. And Florida becomes, quote, a sovereign an independent nation. 
So on its way to joining the Union, Florida declares itself a so sovereign nation and then joins the Confederacy thereafter. The terms, governor uh, and ho house has two years, Senate has four, judges now appointed by the governor and uh, restrictions are allowed on free blacks under this constitution. Uh, Florida population at this time, total Florida population, including slaves, is 54,477. So Florida still is very much a rural state. And um, a constitution that's adopted in 1860 uh, uh, serves Florida and through the Civil War. And we then come to the Constitution of 1865, which was adopted by uh, people hoping that the, that, the, uh, that, the, that this new Constitution would allow us to be readmitted to the Union. It was never ratified by the people of Florida, but it was supposed to be effective in November of 1865. But it was not adopted by the Federal Congress, and why not? Well, the Constitution of 1865 had general provisions uh, similar to those uh, of the uh, 1861 Constitution. Governor has a four-year term as a lieutenant governor who also is in the Constitution at this time. There's an elected Secretary of State. Remember, there was no elected cabinet officer under the earlier Constitution. Legislators were to be white men who had been in the state for two years. Judiciary was appointed by the governor. Suffrage, white, free males. Apportionment was spelled out in the Constitution. The boundaries spelled out, but somewhat limited. Uh, a provision was in the Constitution for all white juries, except uh, colored persons could be witnesses in cases that involved of black uh, citizens. So look at this Constitution as a very restrictive document. Uh, did these people who fashioned this Constitution realize that there had been a civil war and that uh, the, uh, the Confederacy had lost the civil war? Uh, it's just incredible when you look at this. But of course, it, uh, to be charitable to this uh, group of people who adopted this Constitution, we would not yet had the, uh, the amendments to the United States Constitution uh, that provided for uh, black suffrage. We had not had voting rights in the Constitution. We hadn't had the 14th Amendment uh, or the 15th Amendment. Again, uh, this was adopted at a very early time trying to get admission to the United States, but it failed. Uh, it was rejected by the Congress and required Florida to go back and design a constitution uh, three years later in 1868. And the 1868 constitution revision, by this time Florida population has grown. Look at the growth. We now have 187,000, almost 188,000 uh, population in Florida. Quite a lot of growth. Uh, new people coming to Florida after the Civil War. Uh, many of these people we call by the name Carpetbagger. There were uh, people who came from the North who had seen something of Florida perhaps during the years of the Civil War. Remember that during that period of the Civil War, uh, Florida uh, was not entirely controlled uh, by the Confederacy. Um, the Union troops held on to Fort Pickens, occupied Pensacola for some period of time. Jacksonville never fell into Union hands. Key West was, remained a, a federal uh, under federal authority throughout uh, the Civil War. So there were a number of federal troops that were in and around Florida during the, during the Civil War. And as often happened in Florida, when federal troops came to Florida, a number of them liked what they saw and decided to come back as citizens. And this happened originally following the Civil War with significant growth in population, still a very small state. Um, but uh, Congress now accepted this Constitution, uh, uh, which was uh, developed uh, amid a great deal of controversy in Florida 
uh, Florida Constitutional Convention had factions even among the Republicans who were elected uh, to the uh, Constitutional Convention. And there also were the people who had been uh, Florida citizens uh, before the Civil War who were who formed a third fac faction uh, in uh, this, this debate. The so-called mule team uh, group uh, of, of members of the Constitution uh, Convention uh, were the people who were the most liberal and who uh, uh, provided uh, the impetus for a number of the important provisions that were adopted uh, by the Constitutional Convention. Uh, we now have a Constitution which actually accepts the result of the Civil War. Now, uh, the earlier uh, uh, Constitution of 1865 did everything it did to just deny that the Civil War had taken place. And so there are very explicit provisions in the 1868 Constitution that uh, 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 refer to natural rights, uh, refer to inalienable rights, which becomes a very important term in Florida constitutional law. Um, notes that slavery and involuntary servitude shall not be tolerated in Florida and declares that Florida shall ever remain a member of the American Union and, and a, a part of the American nation. Um, very important in the Constitution of 1868 is boundaries. I'm not going to linger on this a great time now because when we get to Article Two of the Florida Constitution, we're going to find this same boundary provision, and we will come to understand how important it was that the 1868 Constitution adopted boundaries, which were different from the earlier Florida boundaries, uh, laid out uh, very specifically. Uh, and this Constitution, remember, is the Constitution which brought Florida back into the Union. Remember that it takes an act of Congress to bring Florida back into the Union. And so in accepting Florida into the Union, the Federal Congress recognized the Constitution of 1868. And we're going to see when we get to Article II how important this was for purposes of the uh, of, of Florida boundaries and for purposes of important Lit, uh, litigation going on relating to the rights of the states. In the 1868 Constitution, uh, we see uh, a great deal of power going to the governor. The original governor is retained in the 1868 Constitution. And we now see the beginnings of a uh, executive cabinet. <coughs> it has a secretary of state, an attorney general, controller, treasurer, Survey, surveyor General, uh, note that title, um, Superintendent of Public Instruction and Adjutant General, Commissioner of Immigration. Uh, here are some cabinet officers that no longer exist. The Surveyor General, the uh, uh, Commissioner for Immigration, existed as cabinet officers in Florida. And um, these offices are appointed by the governor with approval uh, of the Senate of Florida. So the appointment and confirmation process is in place here, and the governor has a great deal of authority uh, over uh, all of government. Uh, the apportionment is spelled out in the Constitution. The legislature is directed to establish a uniform system of county, township, and municipal government. Their limits on local and special laws. Uh, we begin to look at limits in the 1968 Constitution, which are quite explicit, but can trace some of their origins back to the 1868 Constitution. The judiciary, which we ought to care about a great deal as, of lawyers, as lawyers, uh, has four types of courts, Supreme Court, Circuit Courts, County Courts, and Justices of the Peace. Uh, there would be a chief justice and two associate justice appointed by the governor with Senate confirmation. Uh, circuit, they have seven uh, circuits. Uh, uh, 
judges are appointed for eight years. State attorney is appointed by the governor for four years. No, not an elected state attorney, but an appointed state attorney. The governor appoints as many justices of the peace as he wishes. There's a constable elected for every 200 uh, registered voters, so elected law enforcement uh, by way of constables, and the constables then uh, take their cases to the justice of the peace or to other courts uh, as appropriate. Very important provision in the Constitution of 1868, the so-called carpet backer Constitution, is that here we have established for the first time really significant provisions relating to education. We're going to see moving into the modern Constitution, particularly the revisions that have been adopted by the Constitutional Revision Commission of 1998, we're going to see very extended provisions in the Florida Constitution relating uh, to education. But they begin with the Florida Constitution of 1868 saying that it is a paramount duty for the state to make ample provision for the education of all children residing within its borders without distinction or preference. Now remember we're in 1868. Uh, where are we with Plessy versus Ferguson? Do we have separate but equal? According to the Florida Constitution, uh, separate schools that are not equal are unconstitutional. But as we know, the Florida courts did nothing to really enforce this provision and ultimately it took decisions by the United States Supreme Court to find that, uh, that uh, separate but equal was not permissible under the Equal Protection Clauses of the 14th Amendment. And we began to get the decisions in the, in the desegregation cases that changed the face of Florida education, both secondary and higher education. Um, the requirement for a uniform system of, of, of common schools, of public schools, and a university system, and shall provide for the liberal maintenance of the same. Again, provisions in the Constitution which were not enforced, and you should ask yourself, how can they be enforced? Are these enforceable provisions of the Constitution? And that question will remain with you as we look at the modern version of Article 9, our education. Uh, education article. Um, we find the first uh, reference to homestead in the 1868 Constitution, and we drop banking as a separate article of our Constitution in 1868. It's no longer this great subject for struggle uh, in national politics, and, and therefore in the state it is now abandoned as a, uh, as a provision of the Florida Constitution. By this time, Bankers and ministers of the gospel are actually allowed to hold office. Whether that was a good thing or bad, uh, I'll leave you to decide. Um, then we have the end of Reconstruction that occurs following uh, the Florida uh, 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 vote in the Hayes-Tilden election in which the Republican Party was given the presidency uh, in a, a decision which probably was one of the original flawed decisions uh, in relating to Florida elections. Uh, but uh, in return for, for giving the Republicans the presidency, there was an agreement that the federal troops would be withdrawn from the South, including Florida. And so uh, the Constitutional Convention of 1885 uh, uh, was chaired by a fellow by the name of Sam Pascoe. Pascoe was a really quite interesting person. He had been chair of the Democratic Party, he was born in London, educated at Harvard. He volunteered for the Confederate Army. He was captured by the Union troops, became a prisoner of war. He became a lawyer. He later became a United States Senator and he chaired the Constitutional uh, Convention of, of 1885, and that Constitution uh, governed Florida for a long period of time. Its major provisions were 
that it restored the election of many public officers. <coughs> so you have local officials now being elected. It, uh, it, uh, it abolished the office of lieutenant governor, but uh, had a legislature of fixed numbers and established an elective cabinet. You find Florida frequently referred to as a state that has a, a cabinet system of governors. That is the executive power <coughs> is shared uh, with statewide elected officials. State elected attorney general, at one time a secretary of state, two fiscal officers, a controller and a treasurer, a superintendent of public instruction, a commissioner of agriculture. Now we dropped some of the earlier cabinet officers that appeared in the 1868 Constitution. We no longer have someone in the cabinet relating to, uh, to immigration. We no longer have anyone who's a surveyor general. We pretty well surveyed out the boundaries of Florida and even the interior of Florida by this time. And we do not have to have a, a state official who's job is to survey Florida. So we dropped those out, but we have, we retained a commissioner of, of public instruction, which was established in the 1868 Constitution. Um, now, uh, the 1885 Constitution is referred to, to some people as the poll tax Constitution. It, uh, although it seemed to stick with the decisions made in the 1868 Constitution not to directly challenge uh, the outcome of the Civil War, it did put in place a poll tax and, and very specifically permitted a poll tax to take place. So a major impact on Florida government for a period of time were, first of all, the limit of the franchise by requiring people to have some means to be able to to pay the poll tax or they would not be allowed to vote, uh, and the establishment of this cabinet system, uh, which uh, meant that you had multiple members of the executive branch that were elected statewide, people with their own constituencies. And uh, it's a bit of a mess. It remains quite a bit of a mess until uh, the uh, Constitutional Revision Commission of 1998 there was an attempt and by the Constitution Revision Commission in that in 1977-78 to entirely abolish the cabinet system and leave all of executive authority with the governor, but uh, that provision, as we'll see, did not pass. So we, we lived with this elective cabinet office for a long period of time. Now, uh, during the time that we lived under this poll tax constitution, um, there were a number of, of amendments. 212 amendments were offered. 149 of them were adopted uh, by the electorate. Uh, and, and so you see this constitution uh, that's constantly changing. Uh, large numbers of changes come to the constitution before we get around to comprehensive uh, revision that takes place finally in 1968. Um, Florida by 1880 was this state of 269,000 people. Um, according to the 1980 census, again, see that we're growing. And uh, during this period of time that uh, this constitution controlled Florida, Florida grew from 200. 69,000 to uh, a population in 1970 of 6,789,000. So it was a period of great growth at a time when we were controlled by this 1885 Constitution. There were some significant changes to the Constitution of 1885 uh, before we got to the uh, Constitution revision of, of 1968 and before the uh, amendments to the judicial article, which began in place in 1972. Uh, there was first of all the establishment of district courts of appeal. So formally, the only appellate court in Florida was the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court at some point became overloaded with the uh, 
appellate cases from the uh, from the circuit courts and uh, other courts in, in Florida, but most of them came from the circuit courts, and it was necessary to establish new courts, and the new courts that were established had to be established by a constitution, and the uh, revisions of, of 1956 then set in place the new uh, district courts of appeal. Originally, three of these institutions existed, and uh, uh, we have the first, second, third DCA. Since that time, as you know, we've added a fourth DCA and a fifth DCA. Uh, also in Florida, uh, a little bit after that, in 1958, we have the Judicial uh, Qualifications Commission, which provides an alternative to impeachment for discipline of judges and also provides uh, for forms of discipline other than removal from office. So uh, the JQC uh, was established in the late 50s and remains a very important institution uh, for the maintenance of uh, integrity of the Florida uh, judiciary. Now, uh, that uh, will now take us up to the point where we need to examine the 1968 constitutional revision. And um, uh, I'll linger again quite a lot uh, on the 68 revision and the following revisions of the judicial article that occurred in 1972 and 1976. Now, uh, you'll have to excuse me when we go through these uh, these revisions because I actually was a part of these upcoming revisions. I have to confess I was not around for any of the 1885 activity, but I was present in 1968 and present in the revisions uh, in 1972. So we'll take a look at that next in our examination of the history of Florida Constitution.